Hello guys, and welcome back to another episode of Trey the Explainer. And as always, sorry for the wait on this one. I've been moving into a new place, so it's been a little difficult to find time. Anywho, I decided because I'm really procrastinating and mentally exhausted with the Megalania Paleo Profile that's been seriously overhyped, to make a new series in addition to all the other ones I've started and haven't been able to keep up with. This time, the series is called Anthro Profile. Oh dear god, why did I choose that title? I mean Human Profile, ugh, gech. You know what I mean. Anthropology profile. The gist of this series will be to discuss humanity itself. And I know that sounds a bit abstract, and that's because it is. The origin of this idea came from me just thinking about heritage and ancestry. Right now, I want you to just think about how many millions, if not billions, of unnamed people you descended from on either side of your family. Your mother, her mother, her father, both their parents and their parents and so on. Back and back till the time of the Mongols. Then the Romans. Back even further to the time of the Egyptians, Greeks, ancient Chinese, Sumerians, and back and back, even further, all those people who create the direct line of descent all the way to you. Now just think about them, and think about your life, your personality, mannerisms, goals, and aspirations, ideologies, belief systems, and dreams, the embarrassing things you've done, or the brave things you've done, and then understand that all your ancestors, every single one of them, live just as detailed and unique lives as yours currently is. Each one of those millions of people with their own unique personalities, some brave, some cowardly, some intelligent, some not so much, some kind and timid, some violent and cruel, some that dreamt of bigger things, and some that lived simple lives. Think of all the human stories these individuals could tell, and how different they would have been in life. Maybe just think about the absurdly crazy number of scenarios in which your ancestors just so happen to give birth to another one of your slightly more recent ancestors. A young man going off to war but loves his girlfriend or wife one last time. A mariner or a sailor who just so happened to spend a night in a brothel when he was in port one night before leaving again. An unhappy arranged marriage that lasted decades, however produced a child nonetheless. When contemplating this, I just think of that scene in Avatar Last Airbender when Aang looks at all the past avatars and there are just so many that they just disappear over the horizon. It's kind of a humbling thought, all these stories, all these lives, lost to us forever. I think something that is often lost when discussing anthropology and history, and even a bit of paleontology, is that history is made up of individuals, actual people that lived, breathed, and dreamed. And unfortunately, we'll never know the stories of all your innumerable ancestors. They are lost to us forever now, as their bodies have long since turned into dust. Some of that dust may be making up you. But we can try to look at those ancestors of people who have survived. I just think it's always cool to see human remains and think about the lives they belong to. The stories and memories that they held within their minds. The stories behind the bruises and healed bones in their skeletons. Sorry if this is rambling, as it probably is. This series' point is essentially that. When you look at human remains in a museum, I don't want you to think of them as just old bones. You are looking at somebody's complex, beautiful, and dirty life. And hopefully, through this discussion of the micro, the lives of these little people who made up history, we can talk about the macro, the major, broad, historical transitions and events that extend beyond the lifespans of a single human. So, in this series, I will examine the remains of a human individual and try to talk about what we can learn about that person, and maybe why they are significant to us. And to start off with this first episode, I will be talking about the individual we call today the Kennewick Man. Kennewick is actually very relevant to many significant aspects of anthropology, and is a bit of a landmark as far as how it's shaped the entire field of study as a whole. Our story begins back on a hot July day in 1996 with two college kids who, one afternoon, were splashing through the Columbia River in Kennewick, Washington, trying to sneak into a residence-only hydroplane race, when suddenly one of them tripped over something on the bottom of the riverbed. Upon closer examination, what the two had just stumbled over was one of the most significant and controversial anthropological finds in the United States, as the object they pulled out of the water was a human skull, chilly water trickling out of its eye sockets, and back into the river it called home for thousands of years. Naturally, the college kids, believing the skull was a recent murder victim, stuffed the skull in some bushes and continued on to the hydroplane race. Come on, we've all been there. After the race, the two returned to the bush, and they retrieved the skull and reported it to local law enforcement. Law enforcement returned to the scene, and dive teams discovered more human bones, 350 accounting for 90% of a complete skeleton. After this, there was essentially a game of hot potato where law enforcement gave the bones to a local coroner, and he gave them to a forensic archaeologist, James Chatters. Studying the bones, Chatters concluded that the remains belonged to a middle-aged man, somewhere between 40 and 55 years old, who was tall, and had a muscular slim build. One of the most significant conclusions he made, which would play an important role in the future, was his conclusion that the skull possessed a presence of Caucasian traits, 
and a lack of definitive Native American characteristics. That is to say, the remains appear to belong to a person of Old World ancestry, specifically European, North African, and Middle Eastern. Caucasian, in the context of anthropology, doesn't necessarily denote European or white, as it does in popular culture. And this probably led to some confusion in the subsequent media storm, but I'll get to that. Chatters additionally believe the remains to belong to someone who died more or less a hundred years ago. However, Chatters noted that a rather curious stone projectile was lodged in the ilium of the skeleton, and that the bone had partially grown around it. The leaf-shaped stone projectile most resembled Native American projectiles from 7,500 to 12,000 years ago which wouldn't make sense in light of Chatter's previous interpretation. A small bone fragment was submitted to the University of California Riverside for radiometric dating to figure out how old the remains truly were. The research and subsequent studies have shown that the remains belong to a man much, much, much older than anticipated. The remains were, in actuality, somewhere between 8.9 thousand to 9 thousand years old, a far cry from the 100 Chatter's first speculated. Now, after the revelation, it was as if a bomb was dropped in the anthropological, archaeological, and paleontological communities. Reason being, human remains of this age, and this intact and well-preserved, are unbelievably rare in the Americas. Most of the remains we have are mere fragments, while this was an almost complete skeleton. At the time of its discovery, less than only 12 other human remains had been discovered and securely verified to be older than 8,000 years old, and again, the majority of these were just fragments. What would be subsequently named the Kennewick Man, after where he had been discovered, represented an absolutely amazing and crucial find into understanding prehistoric humans in the Americas. The migration of Homo sapiens into the Americas is perhaps one of the largest mysteries and debates in the entire field of archaeoanthropology, even to this day, especially when trying to figure out when and how humans entered the Americas, because we no longer have one fully agreed upon answer. Ask any anthropologist, and you will probably get a dozen different answers. That dominant theory you've been told for decades about humans traveling across the Bering Land Bridge connecting Alaska and Siberia 13,000 years ago? Nope. nope. There's evidence that shows humans might have been living in the Americas thousands of years before that became a thing. And humans might have been chilling as far as South America from anywhere between 30,000 years ago to 20,000 years ago. When you look at a map showing all the oldest human remains in the Americas, their distribution is all over the place, and it makes absolutely no sense. And there's an abundance of theories trying to explain this. From the traditional Bering Land Bridge hypothesis, to the coastal migration Kelp Highway hypothesis, to, I think, the pretty flawed Salutrian hypothesis, to even a Pacific Islander hypothesis, to a combination of a whole bunch of these. Were there multiple independent migrations over a long time, or just one? From Kennewick Man, scientists could be able to understand and start to comprehend some of these mysteries. From his well-preserved skull, we might be able to figure out what he ate, what he drank, and who he was or is related to. And I guess this is a good segue into the media sensation that took over this case. The combined age in Chatter's Caucasian interpretation made some, especially those in the media, to suggest that Kennewick Man represented a race or population of white European humans that predated the ancestors to the Native Americans in the United States. This interested some white supremacists and the Odinist, a strange tribal Norse Viking tribal identity, who started to use Kennewick to support European land claims over Native Americans, believing themselves to be the original inhabitants. And all of these came to a head when in 1998, Chatters released a reconstructed head of what Kennewick looked like in life, which strongly resembled, oh my god! Chatters and other anthropologists began to rephrase or change their initial interpretations of Kennewick man's race, based on his skull shape, and began to instead lean towards the idea Kennewick closely resembled Pacific Islanders and Jomon slash Ainu, the indigenous inhabitants of Japan, go check out that video, populations, which further complicate the matter, and if true, could radically have impacts into human migrations into the Americas. But, wait, that's not all. At this point, Native American organizations, specifically the Umatilla Native American tribe who inhabited the region, caught wind of all this. They began referring to the Kennewick man by their own name, the Ancient One, believing him to be among one of their ancestors. The Umatilla demanded the remains be returned to them as under the Native American Graves Protection and Reparation Act, which is a federal law that states if Native American remains are found on federally owned lands and a cultural affiliation with a certain tribe can be established, the remains must be returned to the ownership of said tribe. And because Kennewick Man was discovered on federal lands, the Umatilla claimed he therefore fell under the NAGPRA and should be returned to them for reburial. Umatilla leaders disagreed with the scientists and stated, from our oral histories we know that our people have been part of this land since the beginning of time. We do not believe that our people migrated here from another continent as the scientists do. 
Furthermore, if Kennewick Man was found under the act, the Umatilla additionally had the right to refuse scientific study of the remains, which seemed likely in this circumstance. Because of this, eight anthropologists grouped together to sue the United States for the right to conduct scientific tests and experiments on the remains as they believed they could give valuable insight. Thus, in 2004, started the case Bonnie Chinson v. United States, a three-way battle between the scientists, the United States Army Corps of Engineers who were in possession of the remains, and the Umatilla along with the support of several other Native American tribes. The main topic of debate in the trial, the concept of kinship. Should Kennewick Man be considered culturally affiliated with modern Native Americans? Can one claim kinship to a thousand-year-old man? How far do family relations extend? Well, the courts ruled in favor of the scientists and rejected the United States Army Corps of Engineers and Native Americans appeals on the grounds that they did not show sufficient evidence for grounds to kinship claim. There were, and still are, differing perspectives on this question, even amongst anthropologists. And I'm going to really try to keep my opinion out of this so I can address the two sides and allow you guys to decide for yourselves. The Scientist Argument the anthropologists argued and the courts agreed that the remains were of crucial scientific importance for reasons I have already explained. The primary argument was that scientific study and testing were of utmost importance prior to returning the remains to Native Americans for proper burial. Additionally, the anthropologists believed that one could not claim kinship with a 9,000-year-old man because, among other things, this man is so ancient and so far removed from modern Native American cultures and identities that 9,000 years ago, almost everyone alive today was related to somebody else. And it therefore raises the question of where kinship ends. Where does it stop, if at all? Should the 5,000-year-old man Otzi be considered kin to modern Italians? Should the 9,000-year-old Cheddar Man be considered kin to modern English men and women? Culturally speaking, Kennewick Man likely would have possessed a culture probably unrecognizable to that of modern Native Americans. And odds are, his culture, his religion, his ideologies, customs, would be as different, or if not more so, to Native Americans as modern Swedes and the Motala people, or modern Englishmen and Cheddar Man. So much time has passed, and so much biological and cultural evolution has taken place that the two peoples have very, very little in common with one another, so it's difficult to claim much of a connection between the two, even if they are in fact related. If Kennewick Man were to grow skin and organs and walk around right now, it is unlikely he would even recognize his modern relatives, at least culturally speaking. To the scientist's credit, and not to sound like that one South Park episode, I took a DNA test myself recently, and found that I had an actually super crazy ancestry. My ancestry is a mishmash of countless traces throughout the Old World. Sardinian, Italian, Greek, North African, Middle Eastern, Eastern European, Balkan, Irish, Welsh, Scottish, English, Chinese, Filipino, Indonesian, Malaysian, Iberian, and even Nigerian. Go far back enough, almost everybody is related to somebody else. It is by no means a stretch of the imagination that I myself might be distantly related to King Tut or Otzi or Cheddar Man and so on. At a certain point, the genes are so watered down that everybody is related to somebody, and at a certain point, we are all kin to each other. So, from the anthropological perspective, does one need permission from relatives so far removed? It's likely, from the scientific perspective, I am no more closely related to some of these ancient individuals I listed above than some of these modern Native Americans in Kennewick. Are these mummies my kin, my family? It's very likely that culturally, at least, we wouldn't agree on close to anything. The Native American argument. Now, from the Native American's perspective, they, I think, are understandably cautious. The relationship between anthropologists and Native Americans back in the old days haven't been great, and I dare say that some early anthropologists were just downright antagonistic and awful to Native American peoples, so much so that some Native American cultures called anthropologists the bone collectors or boogeymen to their children if they didn't watch themselves around these men. The historical context in the situation, which often doesn't translate well, is bad, and I think does warrant some attention. I can definitely see how some Native Americans look at this case as another attempt by the primarily white scientists to steal another thing that belongs to them. Additionally, I think from people who aren't as well acquainted with science, they can see science and experimentation as the way Walt Whitman sees it in his poem The Learned Astronomer, as something cruel and cold and unfeeling, something out of Frankenstein where things are poked and prodded. Hopefully in this case and subsequent cases, it will be different and maybe some anthropologists can help bridge this gap and mend some bridges, which seems to be the case. The Native Americans claiming kinship very clearly value the Ancient One, and believe him to be an almost spiritual grandfather with a very religious importance, and they see scientists as people trying to steal and keep him from them. They consider him family regardless of how removed from them personally he may be. It seems the anthropologists and Native American advocates possess very different views and definitions of family and kinship, and I'm not sure if there's any way to objectively resolve this conflict. 
As said before, the courts sided with the scientists, but to this day the case remains kind of unresolved and pretty much everybody has their own opinion. Some say the anthropologists were in the wrong, and some have even gone so far to say worse things about them, while others say they were in the right, and the reins belong to science due to their obvious academic and scientific value. It's caused politicians to relook the definition of Native American, in addition to many other questions already proposed. Some have worried that Kennewick Man has set a precedent for Paleo-Indian remains. La Brea Woman's exhibit at George C. Page Museum, for instance, was removed around the time of the Kennewick trial, out of fear for Native American demands that the remains be returned, like Kennewick's. At the time of the case, DNA studies were rather rudimentary, and at the time, DNA could not be extracted and used to verify Kennewick's ancestry, but I'm not actually sure it would change things. However, by 2015, methods had perfected, and a study of Kennewick Man's DNA ancestry was released. The evidence showed that Kennewick was not related to Europeans, or Pacific Islanders, or Ainu, but solely fellow Native Americans, with his closest living relatives being modern Native Americans. He belonged to mitochondrial and Y-chromosome haplogroups that are both characteristic of the average Native American. The excellent 2015 study titled The Ancestry and Affiliations of a Kennewick Man illustrated that Kennewick Man and a similarly aged paleo-human, the Anzic One Child, share genetic similarities to a lot of widely varied Native American groups the two sharing a high degree of ancestry with Native Americans from Central and South America. Kennewick was, however, closer related to the Colville Native Americans who still inhabit the general region in which Kennewick was found. As far as I know, Kennewick Man does not seem to have any direct descendants that he is tend to the whatever power great-grandfather he would be to. As far as we know, it is probably more likely he's an extremely old and far-removed uncle or cousin to the ancestors of our surviving Native Americans. Regardless, this brings up the question, if he is so closely related to Native Americans, why then did his skull allegedly resemble a Caucasian so much and not resemble a typical Native American skull? Well, this is the problem with trying to fit prehistoric humans into modern racial classifications and distinctions. As we've already learned with the Ainu, and in 10,000 BCE with the prehistoric dark-skinned Europeans, evolutionary change occurs pretty quickly. The crazy amount of human diversity we have today is a direct result of evolution by natural selection, which favored certain traits such as larger teeth, bigger noses, higher cheekbones, darker or, or lighter skin, and so on in populations in response to the environment. As scientists often find when examining prehistoric humans from thousands of years ago, is that humans have changed a great deal over time. Europeans used to have darker skin and blue eyes just a few thousand years ago, so it is only natural that something similar might have happened between prehistoric Native Americans and modern ones. And this is actually really common. Scientists often see unique and different facial shapes that really don't fit into modern classifications in Paleo-Indian skulls. Luzia, a 11,500-year-old skull from Brazil, possessed a skull shape that closely resembled those of indigenous Australians, Melanesians, and Native Africans, and we had a bit of a reversal situation with the Kennewick Man, where Africans instead of Europeans and Native Americans were claimed to have inhabited America first. Some skeletons found on the Peruvian coast are said to have Pacific Islander traits, or others still are said to have Chinese and Japanese characteristics. Chatters, the anthropologist that to some started this whole debacle, has since addressed this fact, that sometimes the cranial analyses can be misleading. In his book, Chatters noted that Kennewick and other ancient Native American skulls predate modern cranial and racial divisions. Chatters apparently has a graph in his book that illustrates just how flawed it is to try to use skull shape to determine race in remains so old. It compared facial dimensions of several ancient Native American skeletons including Kennewick Man, and modern Africans, Asians, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders, and Europeans. The Paleo-Americans were off on their own on the graph, unclassifiable compared to modern racial divisions. All seven of them apparently showed more variation amongst themselves than the other groups did with one another. Point being, appearances can be deceiving. Anthropology often teaches us that race is a social construct, and in reality such clear-cut divisions don't exist, and things are way more vague, especially when looking at prehistoric people. Skull shape appears to have evolved and changed in Native Americans over the generations, and varies greatly even between individuals of the same ethnic background. In Kennewick Man, Lucia, and many others illustrate this transition, this weird gray period where the ancestors of people didn't exactly look like their descendants, and people couldn't be separated in clear distinctions. Although Kennewick Man was a Native American and related to them, he didn't completely resemble them in life, in the same way Cheddar Man doesn't resemble his modern relatives. Now you might be wondering, what happened to the Kennewick Man then? Well, he's been chilling in the Burke Museum at the University of Washington since 1998. The museum was essentially a joint security area, a court-appointed neutral zone for the remains as the museum did not exhibit them. Legally, the remains were still property of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Native American tribes still wanted the remains reburied, and even after the court case, the Army Corps of Engineers continued to deny scientists' requests, except for a brief 16-day examination in 2006 to conduct further scientific studies on the skeleton. 
Kenny McMahon for a decade was in this limbo where essentially nobody got what they wanted. After the 2015 DNA study, Washington politicians called for the remains to be returned to the Native American tribes. On February 17, 2017, Kenwick Mann was removed from the Burke Museum almost two decades after he'd entered it. The next day, he was reburied in an undisclosed location in a ceremonial burial, never to be seen again. And as a science guy, I have to say it's a little depressing regardless of whose side you're on when you think about how little we got to learn about Kennewick Man. Who was this guy? What was his life like? Well, apparently during that brief window that the army allowed, forensic anthropologist Douglas Owsley examined much about the skeleton. He theorized that Kennewick was right-handed due to the fact the bones in his right arm were larger than his left. He found that Kennewick lived a tough and rough life, sustaining many injuries from a healed fractured rib to a fracture on his forehead to that spearhead in his hip which had healed. How did he sustain these injuries? A hunting accident? A stupid and dangerous game of chicken among friends? Only the man could tell us. Chemical measurements in his bones suggest that although he was found hundreds of miles inland, he ate primarily marine animals like seals and drank glacial meltwater, suggesting he was very well traveled. Douglas's team believe from their research that he was 38 years old and due to the position of his body, he had been buried delicately, likely by members of his tribe and family, in that riverbed all those years ago. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this rather lengthy first episode of Anthropology Profile. Please tell me what you thought of this series. I live in a vacuum most of the time, so I need some other people's opinions. I had no idea that I was going to focus so much on the modern controversy with this guy, as opposed to learning about the life of this man, in particular. But I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless, and enjoyed some of the questions and discussions being made. My apologies if it seems my channel is getting more political, because that's not what I'm intending. I just want to have interesting discussions. Please tell me what you thought. Who did you side with? Do you think Kennewick Man should have been returned to be reburied, or continue to be further studied? It'll be cool to hear other people's opinions, as I very clearly as a human being have my own opinion, and odds are you probably picked up on it despite my efforts. Anyways, this video is long enough, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching this video and supporting my channel. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Fingers crossed for 300,000 subscribers. I hope you learned something new and I got a lot planned, and hopefully I'll see you next time for another video. Alright, see ya! Going underground, going underground, Dun 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 it's start to pound going underground going underground dun 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 for tomorrow oh la 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 la